All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I am delighted to be joined by J.R. Butler, who is in Miami, Florida, on the other coast. How are you doing, J.R.? Good, sir. How are you? Excellent, excellent. And J.R. Uh, fell into technology sales following a long hockey career that included including being a D1 athlete at Holy Cross. And then he was an early sales leader at Turbonomic, which was sold to IBM for twenty for $2 billion. And then after a stint as a CRO, you then started the Shift Group, Shift Group, which helps athletes transition into technology sales. And that's what we're going to talk about today is sales and athletics. It's a really interesting topic uh, here, JR, because... A lot of people default into sales, right? You know, a lot of people go to college and maybe they'll do a marketing degree and then they finish their marketing degree and they suddenly discover that for every market, you know, for every 500 sales jobs, there's one marketing job. So they end up defaulting into, reluctantly into sales. So um, you're obviously helping encourage and transition athletes into technology sales. So first of all, why do you think athletes are uniquely qualified for technology sales or what attributes do they have that really lend themselves to this industry? This well, I think, job? yeah, I, I think, um, there's the, the low hanging fruit is pretty easy to talk about, right? You know, when you think about athletes, you think about resiliency, right? They're, mm -hmm. these are the type of humans they're used to losing. They're, they're used to getting cut from teams. They're used to coming back from injuries. There's just, there's a muscle of like going through adversity that comes with competing on a day-to-day -day basis your entire life. Um, obviously, you know, being motivated through competition, uh, that's what sports is. It's a meritocracy. So the idea that you can deliver your own outcomes uh, based off your performance and you're being measured against other people um, obviously has a ton of parallels to sales um, work ethic, right? Like there, that's a thing that, you know, your work ethic directly affects the outcomes that you can drive, just mm -hmm. like sports. How, how much time are you going to spend in the gym? How much time are you going to, you know, practice your skills, things like that? Um, I think coachability is something that is actually, you know, not talked about enough. Um, most people don't take constructive criticism very well, especially nowadays. I think athletes are unique in that they're used to getting feedback, maintaining their confidence, and using that feedback to get better at something. And I think, in a, especially early in a career, being able to take constructive criticism and feedback and not let it impact your confidence is super important. Mm -hmm. And then I, the last piece I think of is, is uh, growth mindset, right? The idea that like, you know, just cause you're not good at something doesn't mean you can't get better at it. Um, so like, you know, and, and with coachability comes teamwork yep. too. And we all know, we all know sales is a team sport. So that's like, mm -hmm. that's kind of the low hanging fruit, but I yeah. actually think. Well, what, yeah. Let me, let me just, let me just uh, uh, come back on a couple of things you said there, because I think they're, they're really interesting. Um, one of the things you said is, uh, you know, used to losing or, you know, and I think, and also let's face it, if you, if you do any kind of sport and you compete in it, you also sometimes, sometimes just decisions go against you or something happens that's unfair. So you have a lot of all of these things that unfortunately a lot of other people who go into sales kind of experience for the first time. So I, I, I love that concept of, of, you know, being understanding what it's like to lose and how you got to come back better. And, and sometimes life isn't fair. So sometimes, you know, you don't get the contract for reasons totally beyond your control or you're told something and then it turns out that it's not the truth, whatever. But I like to think it, what you're saying there is that this is something that kind of, you know, as you said, you have a muscle memory for if you've competed at all in, in sport. Yeah, it's 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 controlling the controllables, right? Like athletes are comfortable with being being in charge of their environment and their world, but also understanding that there's stuff outside of their control that can negatively impact them. And that's I had, I had never honestly really even thought of that. Uh, that's mm -hmm. a really good good example of that resiliency piece, without a doubt. 
Yeah, absolutely. And uh, and I think the other thing there that you 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 said that I think is really critical and and, <laughs> and you said low hanging fruit, but I think this is so critical. And that is, uh, you know, athletes are used to practicing and they're used to developing their skills. Now, unfortunately, there's an awful lot of salespeople who never focus on developing their skills, who don't practice. They wait around maybe for their company to put them through some training. But it's like I always say, it's like, you know, we love our we love our hobbies and our sports, whatever they are. Maybe you're a golfer, right? I guarantee you, you probably pay money to somebody to for golf lessons. You probably buy video. You probably are always studying, how do I improve my string swing? Um, but how often are you doing that for the thing that puts bread on your table? Probably never. So that's what I'm saying. Again, it's another thing where you already come into it knowing that if I'm going to be good at something, I'm going to have to practice. Yeah, and, and I would even take that a step further. Um, and it's not just practice, right? Like one thing that athletes understand inherently is it's it's practicing with intention, right? Mm -hmm. You know, famous saying, perfect practice makes perfect. Um, so this idea of like, you know, going through the motions on a skill or a habit or a process is one thing, but doing that with intention, measuring like where you're weak and where you need improvement and then going back to the drawing table and, and continuing to practice that thing with intention until you get it right. That's, that's unique to athletes. That, that idea of like practicing with intention, as well as like a lot of people will, will practice things that they're good at already. Cause it's, it's comfortable. It's like, you know, I used to shoot pucks. I was a hockey player, like you said, and I would shoot 400 bucks a day in my driveway. And my dad would ask us at the, at the end of the day, be like, how many pucks did you shoot? And I, you know, immediately I'm like 400 pucks. And my dad would say, well, how many backhands did you take? Because I sucked at backhands. Mm -hmm. And when I was younger, I wouldn't practice them at all because that's uncomfortable. I'm not good at it. So I didn't want to sit in the driveway and take 500 backhands. But I, I, I got to understand that to be really great at something, you don't just practice what you're good at. You have to really practice what you're really bad at and turn a weakness into a strength. And that comes with practicing with intention. Yeah, no, that's a, that's another um, ex excellent point because yeah, we tend to like practice the things that we like and avoid practicing things that we don't we don't like. And the other two things before you move on to the the next level, um, the other two things you mentioned is coachability, which I think is that is so so critical because uh, that's one of the things that. Uh, it, throughout my career, certainly recent uh, or companies that I've been with, we've always looked for in salespeople is coachability. It's so, so important. And it's something that you, that maybe we fool ourselves to think that most people are naturally coachable. Well, they're not. Um, and that's why also the, the onus is on the, the leadership there to actually know how to coach as well. Yeah. Yeah. Coachability definitely goes, goes both ways. And I think, you know, coachability it's it, especially nowadays, right? Like it's, it's really hard to identify in an interview process if someone can take feedback and, mm -hmm. and not take it personally or not like make excuses of like, Oh, well, this is why I think I'm right. Right. Like, so mm -hmm. coachability takes a certain level of like kind of humbleness to really be able to apply it on a day-to-day -day basis. And you still have to bring that confidence, right? Like you've got to be able to take negative feedback, like regularly, and still like feel like you're really good, um, yeah. especially as a salesperson. That's hard. Yeah. So those are the, um, including the growth mindset, those are the, the, you said at the beginning, the low hanging fruit, all of which I think are critically important. So even if it was just those things you're focused on, you'd, you'd be ahead. But t take us to the next level of, of why athletes make great technology salespeople. So, and, and these have just come up like recently as I've worked with more and more elite athletes Like we've helped a lot of professional Olympic and like, you know, high level D1 athletes. And what I've started to recognize is, is three traits. And we've actually talked about one of them because you, you dug in a little bit, but you know, I'm, I'm a, not that smart. So I like to keep it simple. I call it the three P's passion for excellence, practicing with intention and pursuing goals. And like what I've started to understand as I've dug into these things is like, if you take those three traits to any career and you apply them, you're going to become elite at, the, at, at whatever it is, whether it's a, a salesperson or a third grade teacher. And when, it, when I say passion for excellence, you have a, a passion to understand the skills, the habits and processes that will make you successful in whatever field you're focusing on. Then you practice those skills, habits and processes with intention 
and you use that practice to pursue goals on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, on a monthly, quarterly, and yearly basis. So like that's that that's like the next level of like, and, and I think we spend a lot of time educating athletes that they even have those traits because a lot of them do it naturally and don't even realize that that's what got them to the level they got to. So those are things that we really preach in our, in our program to make sure they understand that if you bring those three traits to whatever's next, if you decide not to do sales, that's fine. But if you bring those three traits, you're going to become part of this elite echelon of people that's, that's really good at whatever you've decided to do. Yeah, no, those 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 are excellent points as well. And uh, yeah, and I, w- I wanted to touch on that whole thing about pursuing goals because um, sometimes people think, well, I'm a salesperson, my my goal is my quota, right? And you go, no, that's your quota. You need to have goals yourself. What are what are your goals to propel yourself forward? And I think that's where what you're talking about here. That's where the difference comes in. Yeah, it's like um, like going back to the, the things that you want to be excellent at. It's skills, habits, and process, right? So there's a skill in sales of like account research. You should be practicing account research with intention and have a goal to be like, I want to be able to look at a business and go through a 10K, an earnings yeah. call, and, and articles about that those executives in 30 minutes versus the three hours it takes me now within three quarters of being in this seat, right? So it's not quota is quota. Like you said, it's not your goal. You need to have goals around development, around, you know, making things a habit like that, that aren't really natural um, and, and following being disciplined about a process, right? Like it's easy to get happy years and get excited and move forward in a deal before you really qualify. Like those are the types of things you have to pursue goals around those intangible things, not just that number, on the dashboard at the end of the quarter. So, I mean, and, and I think that's a really critical point as well, because it, it's it's great to start doing things, but it's the consistency that makes a difference. So say, for instance, as, as your hockey career went on and as you became an elite hockey player, how often did you practice the fundamentals? Like 10 times more than we played, right? Like, right. you know, there was, you know, literally every summer was stick handling is like the most fundamental skill you can have in ice hockey. We, I did that 30 minutes a day in my driveway, skating 30 minutes a day, right? Like these are shooting, shooting a puck. Like the fundamentals are the foundation for that elite level of, of like, you know, winning a lot of games, getting a scholarship, getting paid to play professionally. Like the fundamentals are the foundation that all of, all of that elite, level is built off of so you've got to start with the fundamentals and you've got to always go back to them especially in times like this when things are tough yeah yeah because the reason i'm just mentioning that is because i often feel like as as we get better at things and as we've been doing them for a while we sort of start to take shortcuts and push things aside and say well i don't really need to do i don't really need to do that and then suddenly maybe things aren't going as well for you and I'm, when when things aren't going as well for people i always say have you gone back to the fundamentals are you doing all of the mundane boring setup stuff that you used to do and you'll often find people will say yeah i'm probably not doing that as much and i like i mean i do i do martial arts and like you i mean sometimes when i go when I go to martial arts training, we just spend the whole time doing basic foot placement, something that you've done thousands and thousands of times before. And you know what? You always find there's always something to correct. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and there's so many little nuggets of like fundamental skills and sales that we start to we start to think of as almost like, you know, part of our part of our nervous system. Like we just do them naturally, like breathing. But mm-hmm you practicing those and going back to them pays off even 15 years into your career, in my opinion. Oh, oh yeah. Without a doubt. I, I absolutely think it's like you were just saying, like call, you know, doing the research and call preparation, all of that. But you did. Uh, and when you were saying doing the research, I think that's a critical thing now for salespeople in general is that you have to be, you have to be insatiably curious about, the business of business and the business of your prospects, right? Because if you're not, you're not going to be able to relate to them. The days of, of a salesperson being able to go off, oh, I don't know anything about business. I'm just here to smile and sell you on my personality. Those are long gone. 
Oh yeah. It used to, you know, I think part of what we do is destigmatizing sales, but people still think yeah. of sales as, as pitching, but mm -hmm. sales isn't pitching, right? Like I was a sociology major with a minor in art history and sign language and didn't own a computer. And I've been selling like the most complex technology solutions in the world to the largest organizations in the world. And I still can't turn my iPhone on, but what I did do really well is I became an expert in my customer's business and the problems that they face and the priorities that they have. And, and if you do that, then you don't really ever need to know the ones and zeros, the bits and bytes and the speeds mm -hmm. and feeds. That's where you need to become an expert to become a great salesperson. Yeah, absolutely. And if you take it back to sports again, I mean, it's you think about it when when somebody talks to you about your favorite team or your favorite sport or whatever you and they know anything about it. You're suddenly in a you know, you're uplifted. You want to engage in the conversation. It's the same in sales. If you show that you know anything about my business or the business that I'm in or anything like that. OK, I'm going to listen to you in a way that I wouldn't listen to somebody else who starts with a pitch. 100 percent people people like to talk about themselves and hear about themselves nobody wants to hear about your product no, nobody cares <laughs> <laughs> and and what what else do you uh, what other piece of advice or, or help did you give to to elite athletes as they want to make this this transition because it is i mean it, as we know yes it, it's it's a team sport but it's also it's also got a lot of individuality to it, and a lot of people are used to that. Um, but how about people who maybe did individual sports as opposed to team sports? Is that something that they need to learn, or did they already know that because, let's face it, their coach and everybody around them is a team too? Yeah, like I, you know, you mentioned golf. Like, you know, we we helped a bunch of former like Corn Ferry professional golfers, um, and what I actually find with those guys is. There is a little bit of a team aspect to it when you have like a caddy and you usually have a coach. Mm -hmm. So you are, you, they do have that coachability factor and they do have that like partnership factor when you're on the course and, and you have your, your caddy that you're working with. Um, but the one thing that they, they have that like other athletes that come from team sports don't have is they have a little more self-starting discipline. Like nobody is, you know, when you're on a football team with 110 other people, you better show up to practice because 109 people are going to be like, where the hell is JR, right? Mm -hmm. When you're a golfer, you're going to the driving range, there's nobody waiting there for you, right? So we actually have had a lot of success with those individual athletes because there's a certain motor that you have to have to get that far in a sport that you play by yourself, essentially against yourself, um, that I think is really unique. So um, there's definitely the team aspect. You still have that, the coachability. But you also have this motor that that you don't see a lot in team sport athletes. Mm. And you just touched on something else there that I think is really important there, and that is the the concept of competing against yourself. Because I think if that if you have that mindset, if, if regardless of whether it's a team sport or, or an individual sport, but if you have that mindset of always comparing yourself to yourself and saying, I want to be better than I was last time, better. I want to be better than I was yesterday or whatever. If you can carry that into sales, that, that's a huge, that's going to, that's going to help you and, and really open a path to success. Well, yeah. I mean, you, if you look at your goals outside of quota, that's pretty much a hundred percent. You're competing against yourself. Like you're, you're constantly trying to improve your own, specific metrics, your own specific skill set, your own specific discipline against the process or habit. So that that like constant internal, you know, competition to get better is is critical. And, and I, I'm sure we both worked with salespeople that like, they're just never satisfied with where they are. Those are the yep. those are the highest achievers and the biggest earners 100% of the time. Yeah. And I guess the last thing I'd just say is that athletes know um, that they almost have to, I mean, they go through life selling themselves, right? I mean, they have to sell themselves to get on the team in high school. They've got to sell themselves to colleges if they want to go, if they want to go into the into the professional ranks or whatever, or if you're, you know, golfer, maybe you've got to sell yourself to sponsors. So you, I mean, in essence, a lot of, a lot of uh, athletes, if they compete at a decent level, are already salespeople in some respects. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, they, they, maybe if they get to the professional level, they have the help of an agent, but they still have to advocate for themselves. Um, and now what we're seeing with college athletes with name image likeness, like 90% of these kids are, are coming out 
with a story to tell about a deal that they did with a brand, whether it's a local mm -hmm. brand or a national brand. So that like that idea of selling yourself is actually way more meaningful in 2022 than it was when I graduated college in the mid 2000s. Like we didn't have that opportunity. Yeah. So a lot of these kids are li quite literally selling themselves to companies now before they ever mm -hmm. graduate. Yeah, well, you know, we're we're gonna have a generation of really highly uh, motivated and skilled salespeople coming through. So, and especially coming out of sports, so it's gonna be good for you. Um, all of Jr.'s information will obviously below the, will be below this video. But before we go, Jr., please do tell people a little bit more about you and your company. Yeah, they can uh, they can find us at www.shiftgroup.io. Um, we, we focus mainly on athletes. That's been the focus for the last 10 months since we started the company. Um, we also help military vets. So if you're a military vet, we'll also work with you and give you access to our training. Our training is free to athletes. And for companies, we have a really cool portal where you can watch game tape on all our candidates and it's completely free. So whether you're a company or somebody trying to break into technology sales, definitely come find us. Um, and I'm also a pretty good follow on LinkedIn. I tend to tell people how I feel. So if you want to laugh, uh, <laughs> please feel free to follow me on LinkedIn. All right. And, and the, all of, uh, all of, uh, JR's social links will be below here too. So I encourage you go join in. Hey, listen, um, LinkedIn could do with some more entertaining stuff on it. So there you go. Check out JR's um, posts. All right. Well, listen, thanks again, JR. Thank you for watching and listening and I'll see you all again soon. Thank you.